Uh, today's speaker is probably the most recent recruit from our computer science department, am I right? Yes, that's <laughs> okay. right. Uh, and uh, he agreed to speak us on uh, lessons from nature on engineering molecules. Uh, Dr. Gevorg Gregorian received his BS in computer science and biochemistry from the University of Maryland, ba uh, Baltimore County, and went on to get a PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for studies in computational protein design and modeling of interprotein interactions. As a postdoc fellow at the University of Pennsylvania in the, labo in the laboratory of Bill de Grado, he continued to work on designing proteins with novel functions. Uh, recently joined the Department of Computer Science at Dar Dartmouth as an assistant professor. Uh, please welcome Kiborgia. Uh, Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Hartov for inviting me to speak at the Jones Seminar. It's a, it's a pleasure. I also had uh, a lot of fun interacting with graduate students earlier this afternoon, so I want to thank them as well for their insightful comments. Um, and today I'd just like to tell you about some of my work on trying to understand how natural proteins function and putting some of that insight to use uh, in engineering novel proteins with new and useful functions. So, of course, the reason why we'd like to understand how proteins work is because they're incredibly functional molecules. In fact, the cell uses protein, proteins in a remarkable variety of ways. For example, as we begin to understand more and more about how the cell senses its environment and internalizes that information to make decisions, we sort of begin to represent that, those kinds of processes with complicated diagrams that look like this. And the point that I want to make here is that each one of these nodes are proteins. Okay, so proteins are really um, very important for allowing the cells to sense information, to integrate information, and make decisions. Of course, proteins also get used for most, more structural purposes and in movement. So, for example, here's a diagram of a flagellum, which is kind of a tail that certain bacteria have that allow them propel, to propel themselves uh, in, in solution. And this is, in fact, a protein machine. So a lot of these pieces are actually proteins. And, of course, proteins are also literally natural chemical factors because proteins know how to take molecules and use them to synthesize new molecules, break them apart, put them together in chemically complex ways. So that's another very important task proteins carry out in the cell. And what's really most remarkable is that all of this richness and function of function is encoded in a seemingly very simple way in that it's simply uh, that proteins are chains of amino acids, of natural amino acids. And indeed, that's exactly what proteins are. Um, so here's one amino acid, here's another amino acid. These are just small, relatively simple chemicals. Um, and they're pretty much the same except for this R group I've denoted here, which is their side chain, which what, what makes one amino acid different from another. So there's 20 different side groups or side chains, and there are 20 different natural amino acids. So when amino acids come together, they can form a chemical bond uh, that forms this growing chain, which is called the backbone, and the side chains then project off to the side and, the, and those are the side chains. So, you know, when this chain is then synthesized, and we call the sort of a string representation of the chain the amino acid sequence, so when the sequence is synthesized, it undergoes what's known as the folding process to attain sort of a well-defined three-dimensional structure that might look like something like this. And it's really this structure uh, and its properties that then encode the function of the protein, and that is what, it perf what function it performs in the cell. And it's uh, sort of important to realize that it's not just a static structure. It's a dynamic structure at room temperature. So it's you know, subject to thermal fluctuations. And oftentimes, those fluctuations, that, that, that dynamic of the molecule is important for its function as well. So this sort of a nice mapping between this kind of a discrete string to structure to function is pretty neat. And it means that proteins are programmable in the sense that if you change the program, if you change the sequence, you change the structure, and you change the function. So that seems pretty simple, and, and certainly is in, in a way, and that's what cells do when they evolve and evolve new functions. But just because proteins are programmable doesn't necessarily mean that they're easy to program. And in fact, this actually turns out something that's very complicated. And it, there's a couple of reasons for it. So first, consider just the sheer amount of sequence space that is available to proteins. Let's think of a protein that is 100 amino acids long, which is pretty short as far as natural proteins go. There is 10 to the 130 different amino acid sequences 
that could code for that protein. So that's, that's an enormous space. And what's worse is that functional sequences within that space are actually quite, quite rare. So there's some work from the Zostak lab where they just ask the question of how often would you find at random an AD residue protein that would have the simple function of binding the molecule of ATP. Now, I should say that this is a relatively simple task because ATP happens to be pretty planar and a sticky molecule, so it doesn't take very much to bind it. Well, they found that only one in about 10 to the 11th randomly sampled sequences have this simple function. So, you know, programming protein is diffi- proteins is difficult. Nevertheless, though, there exists this programming language that goes from sequence to structure to function, and if we could crack that language and understand it, there's a lot that we could uh, use the diverse functionality that proteins can code for in engineering. And so in the rest of the talk, I'd like to tell you about um, some of the ways in which I've begun, or I've tried to decode this programming language to understand how proteins work and put that to use in engineering applications and how I've used computation to do this. So first I'll tell you about a computational approach that has allowed me to design specific protein-protein interactions. Next, I'll tell you about a methodology I developed for designing uh, specifically structured protein assemblies around carbon nanotubes. And then finally, I'll tell you how uh, detailed uh, dynamics-based consideration has allowed me to design um, really the first ever functional transmembrane protein channel. Okay. So one of the really fundamentals, fundamental functions that proteins perform in the cell is that they come together and interact, forming complexes that encode new functions. So going back to this little diagram that I showed you, you know, all of these arrows represent interactions. And when complexes are formed, new functions are developed. And what's interesting is that proteins are able to do this in a very specific manner, in that only certain interactions occur. And we're beginning to understand, getting to get a glimpse of that specificity through uh, high-throughput experiments that are mapping out entire interactomes within organisms. That is the set of all protein-protein interactions. So here's, for example, a presentation of the interactome from the C. elegans organism. It's a metazoan organism. And uh, here nodes represent proteins and edges represent detected interactions. So we can see that even from this very simple representation, out of the very many possible protein-protein interactions, only a small fraction actually form. And so, you know, it's a very interesting question. How does this, uh, how does this happen? Um, I like to think about... Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. I, I like to think about this specificity problem as a, sort of a supermarket, right? So imagine you're going to a supermarket and you'd like to buy... The funny thing is that my computer's not doing anything. But um, So imagine you're going to the supermarket and you'd like to find, uh, buy a particular item. So you might ask where that item is located. You take a short walk to find it. You pick it up, you buy it, and that seems pretty simple. But imagine now that you're more of a stochastic shopper. I think it's when you shake Really? <laughs> because because my, my computer doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, well... I can set over here. Oh, maybe do you think it's not attached well? That could be. I don't know. It's just another hypothesis. <laughs> we do need to test all the variables. That didn't help any. So let's continue and see how it gets. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it works. So just commit the slide to memory. So when, when it. <laughs> No. Uh, so, all right, where was I? Yeah, so let's imagine now that you're more of a stochastic shopper, right? So you randomly, um, you randomly wander through the sup- supermarket, uh, just sort of bumping into items and, you know, trying to see every time if that item is what you're looking for. Now, of course, because there's so many different items, and because items sometimes look different, there's a certain, or I should say sometimes look similar, there's a certain probability that you'll bump into an item and pick it up even though it's not the one you're actually, you're actually looking for. And so, because there's so many alternative possibilities, unless that probability is really low and ideally just zero, you'll be walking out with the wrong item every time. So proteins actually face a very similar challenge in the cell in that each protein has a potentially very many incorrect partners to interact with. Uh, 
and just very few correct ones. But somehow they're still able to pick out and interact just with the physiologically relevant partners. So this is the question I got interested in. And because this entire interactome is really very complex, I decided to study it in the context of a subnetwork of this entire network. And it's a subnetwork that's spanned by proteins that share a lot of sequence identity, so that they're very sim similar on the sequence level, but they nevertheless display um, some very complicated features in, tr in terms of choosing their interaction partners. So this subnetwork is spanned by a family of protein known as BZIPs. BZIPs are what are called transcription factors. And transcription factors are proteins that bind DNA and regulate the expression of nearby genes. So BZIPs bind DNA as dimers, and they dimerize via what's called a coiled coil motif. So this is sort of a, where two helices, alpha helices, come together and wrap around each other. Um, and there's about 50 BZIPs that, are, that exist in the human genome. And which BZIPs come together to interact is actually pretty important because that determines what kind of a DNA binding site is formed. So therefore, what parts of DNA are bound and which genes get regulated. And this entire interactome of BZIP on BZIP interactions has been actually mapped out in a Keating lab. And this sort of matrix represents that interactome. So we list all the BZIPs along both the Y and the X directions. And um, the, the color of the dot uh, corresponds to the strength of the cross interaction, with the, light, uh, the yellow and the white dots corresponding to no interactions and the dark dots corresponding to strong interactions. So this presented me with an interesting opportunity because I knew the structure uh, through which these interactions were happening. It was the coiled coil. I obviously knew the sequences of these proteins. And so the question was, can I understand why this particular pattern of interactions is happening by looking at the physical level, what goes on within this interface? Okay. So my goal was to consider every pair of BZIP sequences that could potentially interact. And knowing that they would form if they actually interacted, they would form a coiled coil structure, then model that sequence in the context of a coiled coil backbone, optimize over all of the side chain degrees of freedom to come up with a structure that corresponds to the lowest, um, to the lowest energy for that particular sequence. And so the goal then was to compare the stability of that structure with the alternative possibility, which is when the two sequences don't interact. And in this case, it's known that when they don't interact, they're actually unfolded. And so, um, Without going into too much detail about exactly how this was done, I used a physics-based model to model this process. Uh, and when I did this, it turned out that it actually worked pretty well. So here's this plot represents the results. Uh, on the x-axis, again, I denote all of the BZIPs, and I group them with each other by sequence family. So all of the BZIPs in this CNC family, for example, are very similar in sequence. So we can sort of look at them as, as one uh, uh, block that behave very similarly. And each of the BZIPs, each of the potential interaction for each BZIPs are denoted in a column whereby the non-interactions, the interactions that aren't detected in the experiment, are shown in blue, and the ones that are, are shown in red. And the y-axis spreads all of the interactions based on the pr physics-based prediction of the model as to how stable that particular complex is. So what we would like to observe is that all of the red dots, all of the interactions, are scored more favorably or lower than the non-interactions, which are the blue dots, which is pretty much what we see for the majority of the families. So, it, so it's telling us that, really, by applying sort of a simple physics-based view and modeling these complexes, we can begin to understand how nature has encoded specificity, how it's making sure that certain interactions happen and certain don't. Um, now, of course, the ultimate test of whether we understand specificity is to say, well, can you now use this insight that you've learned from modeling these to go on and design new proteins to display desired levels of specificity that interact with some things and not with other things. And it actually turns out that this is a difficult problem. So let me just characterize it in general terms. Let's say you have a target protein that you'd like to interact with. So you have a design that you'd like to attach itself with the target protein. But you'd like to avoid interactions with a set of related, similar, but different proteins. And you'd also obviously like to avoid interactions with yourself. So this is, in a sense, a constrained optimization problem, since you're trying to optimize the stability of the target design complex under the constraint that all the other possible complexes are unstable. But there's not really a good way to solve this constrained optimization problem, because as I showed you with the examples of BZIPs, 
in order to tell whether any particular complex actually forms, you have to go through a complicated numerical simulation that's, that's based on structure prediction and an energy evaluation. So this, so, and obviously, this process isn't very simply amenable to optimization. But using a computational technique that, re, that basically recognizes that no matter how complex this process is, uh, the final energy readout is always a function of sequence, I was able to actually directly extract that function of sequence as an analytical function, which allowed me to formulate this entire specificity design problem as an integer linear program. Now, I realize I've essentially not given any, of the de any details on the computational procedure, and I would love to talk about it if anyone's interested. But just sort of in the interest of time, I'm skipping over the details. Um, and so then, with this procedure, with this general solution to the specificity design problem, we thought, okay, so can we now go on and create a specific partner for each BZIP family such that it doesn't interact with any of the other BZIP families? So I remind you, there are 20 BZIP families, and we tried this for each of them, and, so, and that worked really well. So in 19 out of the 20 cases, we were actually able to interact with the partner that we wanted to interact with, and in half of those cases, we, the, that interaction, the intended interaction, was actually the most stable out of all the possible interactions, which means that in half the cases, we attained the level of specificity that we desired. So this was a huge success because uh, design of specificity on this scale had really not been attempted before. Now, of course, we, it only worked in half the cases, but nevertheless, we were, we were very excited because um, it meant that not only are we able to post-rationalize knowing sort of the answer, why, is, why are the patterns of interactions the way they are, but we could also start designing new proteins that display um, the kinds of interactions that we want them to display. And of course, uh, you know, why would we want to do this? There's plenty of applications for this, um, and one is, again, going back to this complicated signaling picture that I've shown here, one way to study these signaling pathways is to knock out individual interactions one at a time. So if you come up with an agent that can bind to this protein and preclude it from performing this function, then you can study that single function on its own by looking at what the cell doesn't do in its absence. So that's one important application. And the other one, of course, are therapeutic applications. We can design drugs that are based on this that go on and perturb the cellular network in a in a defined way to sort of rescue the disease state. Okay, so, um, so that's as far as specificity. Now, I told you, though, that the repertoire of proteins is, is very large. There are lots of different tasks that they can perform. So can we use some of, some of their other abilities for something useful? So I told you that one of the things that proteins know how to do is assemble into complicated machines spontaneously. So this is, you know, again, the flagellum, which assembles spontaneously. Another good example is the assembly of a viral capsid, which also happens completely spontaneously. Um, and this idea of spontaneous assembly is actually very interesting in the context of nanotechnology, because by and large, this problem of, you know, fabrication as assembly is kind of a large uh, unsolved challenge in that field. So I'm sure <clears throat> many of you have heard of carbon-based nano... Um, Materials, and I'm sure all of you actually know about them much more than I do. Uh, but uh, so, for example, nanotubes, graphene, and, and fullerenes, uh, they possess some pretty impressive physical characteristics and that have had people excited over a possibility of new engine engineering on the, nano, on the nano scale. But the problem with these molecules is that they're very non programmable. Right? So they're, they're sort of boring and featureless naked surfaces that like to stick each, to each other. and you know, non-specific ways, and they're hard to build out of. Whereas proteins and other biomolecules are very programmable. And so the idea is if we could combine the two, the programmability of proteins and the necessary and interesting physical properties of these nanomaterials, then we can start to really engineer something very interesting. So we started thinking along these directions, and we wanted to design some proteins that form you know, these interactions with nanomaterials, but we realized that, you know, this would be something completely unprecedented. I mean, this never happens in nature. So we would be designing something that essentially never normally happens. And so we started asking ourselves this question, well, what kinds of structures, what kinds of protein assemblies are even in principle designable? Because we, we need to know that before we actually start designing anything. And uh, in the field of de novo protein design, which is, that, which is where you try to create novel structures from scratch, ones that never existed before, it's, it's known that certain uh, protein structural uh, states are a lot harder to stabilize with natural amino acids than others. 
And this concept of designability really goes back to the fact that there is a limited number of amino acids and a discrete number of ways in which they like to pack and interact, and that gives rise to a limited set of possibilities as far as structure. So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but I'll just tell you that one of these two helix-helix interactions is completely non-designable. It never happens in nature, and you couldn't make it happen with natural amino acids. Um, and I don't actually remember which one it is. And that's sort of the point, that you can't necessarily tell by just looking at a structure um, that it may be unrealizable, undesignable. So then I started thinking about it. Well, how can I tell um, what kind of a limitation does designability impose on the space of possible structures? And so I thought that one way to, to study this is to look at a protein structure that's very well characterized in the structural database and just look at the range of, 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 um, of instances that that structure can take on. So I focused on, the, again, the so-called coiled coil motif, which, again, is this several helices that wrap around each other in a rope. And a nice advantage of that structural motif is that its um, backbone structure is very well represented with a simple mathematical parameterization. So then what I could do is analyze, in terms of these parameters, all of the known structures of cooled coils, and then look at the distribution, the, the uh, observed distribution of these parameters with the ones I would expect purely based on the rules of geom geometric feasibility, and that should give me an idea of how limiting is the requirement designability on the space of structures. And by the way, if anyone's interested, I have a little web-based applet that you can use to perform this parameterization on, on any protein. And so when I did this analysis, I saw that no matter what parameter I looked at, whether it was the intrahelical shift or the helical phase, which determines the angle of one helix with respect to another, or the helical crossing angle, or many of the other parameters I looked at, that they all had very biased distributions, and that uh, only small areas of parameter space were actually populated, even though sort of entire areas were completely feasible, just from a geometric standpoint. And so when I did this analysis quantitatively, I was able to show that, at the very least, only about one in 100 structures that would be generated purely based on the rules of geometric feasibility would actually be designable with natural amino acids. So this told me that, indeed, designability imposed a very significant constraint. And before I could go on and design something very unnatural, which is assembling proteins around carbon nanomaterials, I wanted to have a general way of assessing designability for an arbitrary structure rather than specifically just a coiled coil. Um, and so I thought that just like for coiled coils, because they were so well represented, I could learn a lot about designability by just looking at all of their examples in the structural database. So too for an arbitrary structure and motif, I could break it down into its elementary components and make sure that each one of the elementary components is actually well represented in nature. And so for that purpose, I developed an algorithm that uh, performs a search for an arbitrary structural motif and essentially tells us whether that motif is something that nature has, has used frequently. Um, and again, I won't go into too much detail about the how the method works, other than to say that it uses the so-called distance map representation of structure to perform the search. So uh, if you imagine that this is your protein structure, a distance map is just a two-dimensional matrix that stores all of the interatomic distances so that the distance between residue i and residue j is stored at position ij. And so then having a query motif, you convert it into a di its distance map representation. And using some clever branch and bound approach, you search for all the instances of that kind of a pattern within your database of structures. So again, if there are any questions about the method, I'd be happy to dis discuss it either now or afterwards. Uh, but the, the cool thing about this is that is the information that this, this kind of a search can provide for you. So let's suppose you're doing a design, and you're thinking about having a structural motif like this. You have a helix packing against two strands. You can run a search on this and find out that, yeah, there are lots of examples of this in the structural database. Nature has used this motif a lot. And not only that, by looking at the sequences of these hits, you can deduce what the sequ amino acid sequence requirements are to encode this particular motif. Now, this is something that would have taken you a very long time if you tried to do this sort of from ab initio physics-based calculations. But, but uh, with this kind of a search, you get this information very quickly. On the other hand, if you'd started with a motif that was just slightly different, where the helix was moved away from the strands by just half an angstrom, so very, very little, you would find that 
That kind of a pattern does not occur in nature at all, even though it's so close to this one. And, and the ones that hit don't really form a well-defined uh, uh, folded ensemble. So, so, you know, armed with this procedure, we could then be a little braver about going on and designing something that hasn't existed before. Um, so then going back to nanotubes, um, again, we were interested in forming a structured assembly around carbon nanotubes. And just by, again, I'm sure most of you know this better than I do, but just in case, just some simple background or single work carbon nanotubes, uh, they can be thought of as having been rolled from a sheet of graphene. And the precise manner in which this rolling happens is defined by two integers. They're, they're called the chiral vector. Um, and so, and, and that, that chiral vector completely defines both the structure and the function of the nanotube. So this is, for example, the 3.8 nanotube, the 5.6 nanotube, the 5.7 nanotube, and so on. Um, now, nanotubes are, of course, completely insoluble in water. But it's been shown that you can solubilize them with things like detergents, or DNA, or even aromatic peptides. So we, too, were interested in making, them, in making peptides that would interact with nanotubes and thereby making them soluble. Um, but instead, what we wanted uh, is, is actually a specifically encoded, a structure, spe structurally specific assembly that we pre-specified and that uh, formed in a, a spontaneous manner. Um, and so in order to achieve this, we developed a generalized approach uh, for coding an arbitrary, uh, structurally and chemically periodic surface, which a nanotube is just an example of. And the idea here is to say, uh, consider a common uh, protein structural unit that displays a chemical functional group that's compatible with a periodic surface, and then arrange it in a manner that's, that's consistent with the period of the surface. Now, the functional group, of course, has to be compatible with the surface that it's recognizing. But still, there are lots of different structural units and lots of different ways of arranging them to be consistent with symmetry. So how do we choose? Well, the answer here, he, again, is designability. Because each one of these interfaces, or each one of these assemblies, necessarily creates protein-protein interfaces. And the, um, the assembly that's most appropriate is one that creates interfaces that are most designable. And since we have this generalized tool for assessing designability, we could go after this problem. So applying this uh, for the case of uh, nanotubes, we, again, we wanted to avoid uh, overly strong interactions with the surface of a nanotube because we were worried that would lead to kinetic traps and individual pieces sticking to our tubes rather than forming a cooperative assembly. So as far as functional groups that recognize the tubes, we chose small and not very hydrophobic amino acids of alanine or glycine um, to recognize the surface, and the alpha helix as our common uh, structural unit. So then to repeat or to match the symmetry of each tube, we realized that it would be nice to match the, this chiral angle that's formed from, th that's a function of the chiral vector. Um, and so we chose this um, um, helical bundle geometry that had a pitch angle that paralleled this chiral angle. And in particular, we chose, for various reasons, we chose an anti-parallel uh, hexameric assembly. Hexameric because that was the number of units that could go around a single nanotube, and anti-parallel because that gave us a couple of extra parameters to play with in design. And so, of course, that just gave us a general topology, not really a specific structure. So at this point is where we turned on this designability filter and said, what is the actual assembly, the actual structure, that would be most designable from within a family of such assemblies. And when we did this, we found that not, this didn't work equally well for all nanotubes. So for example, the assemblies that we designed against the 3A tube produced most designable interfaces. And so it told us that the 3A tube is most amenable for, for wrapping in this particular manner. And more than that, it told us that um, since there are actually two topologically different interfaces in an interparallel hexamer, it told us that these two interfaces had to be very different in order to optimize the designability of the entire complex. So it told us that one of them had to be narrow and rich in small alanine residues, and the other one had to be wide and rich in leucine and isoleucine residues. So again, this kind of a calculation would have taken a very long time to do from first principles, but we were able to very quickly gather this information by just doing a simple database search. Moreover, when we did this overall optimization and found our best possible assembly structure, which is shown here in orange, uh, 
we realized that there already was a natural protein with the core that matched this geometry very well. And it's, show, it's called DSD, and it's shown here in green. So that we actually pursued two different design strategies. In one case, we used this de novo generated assembly geometry and designed based on, on that template. And in another case, we actually took that natural protein and simply removed the amino acids from the middle in order to make space for a um, nanotube to fit. So they gave us four different designs. Uh, and next was um, actually time to test whether these designs worked. So I, as I told you before, nanotubes are completely insoluble in water. So that if you try to suspend them in water and spin them down, the, all the nanotubes crash out of solution, and so the water stays completely clear, or the solution stays completely clear. However, if you have uh, our designed peptides present in solution, they actually stay in solution, and they actually stayed in solution for the duration of our study, and the solution stays very dark. So that was very encouraging. So that meant that our peptides actually do interact with the nanotube. Moreover, this didn't really work for control peptides, where we purposefully messed up the design strategy by making a single amino acid substitution in the design. So that told us that not only are they working, but they're working likely in the way that we designed them to work. Further, using the technique of 2D photoluminescence, we were able to actually isolate the relative contribution of the different nanotube species within the overall suspension. And excitingly, for the de novo designed peptides, the two de novo designed peptides, hexcoil, gly, and ala, the dominant contributor came from the 3 8 tube, which was exactly the tube that we showed uh, on the calculation to be most appropriate geometrically for being wrapped with these peptides. Uh, next, we also solved the structure of one of the designs, and of course, without the nanotube, because we couldn't really crystallize it with. And interestingly, it formed a tetramer without nanotube, not a hexamer. But the asymmetric unit of that tetramer was, uh, in, uh, was very, very close to the one in the hexamer. So the difference between the two was 1.2 angstrom. And so that meant that even without the nanotube, the peptides already poised to interact with the surface of the tube. And then finally, to further verify the geometry of this assembly, and also to demonstrate um, that this new nanotube peptide uh, sandwich, if you will, has addressability and has some actual useful features, we decided to use the surface of the peptide to drive the, to nucleate the growth of gold nanoparticles. And for that reason, we introduced cysteine residues at positions in the peptide where two cysteines come close together and make a nice binding site for gold atoms, and hopefully, we hope that that would nucleate the growth of gold nanoparticles. And absolutely amazingly, this actually worked, and gold nanoparticles actually grew, and when we imaged them by TEM, we saw that the patterns, you can already see this by, with the naked eye, the kinds of patterns that we were seeing were entirely consistent with the patterns that we expected based on the design model. And when we did some quantitative comparisons of inter-particle distances, et cetera, they actually matched quantitatively. So, um, so this was very exciting, and it, uh, beg it was beginning to tell us that by using simple rules uh, uh, of how natural proteins come and assemble, we can start to design things that are very unnatural, such as the wrapping of a nanotube with peptides, and then further demonstrate the use of such materials by using them to direct uh, site-specific uh, growth of nanoparticles. And it was specifically nice that we did this in a very general way, um, such that that would allow us to build a very large number of you know, assemblies that are only limited by our imagination, in a sense, based on a very small number of recurring motifs that we know work in nature, and we even know the amino acids that could make them work. OK, so understanding how proteins assemble and sort of the, 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 design, the design principles behind natural structure certainly is important and puts us another step closer to figuring out this programming language of proteins. But I told you before that it's not just the frozen three-dimensional snapshot of a protein that's important for its structure. There are also dynamic considerations. And one particular function in the cell for which dynamics is actually known to be a very important determinant of structure or of, of function um, is uh, cross, what's called cross-membrane transport. So as you know, cells are these complex machines that are surrounded by the cellular membrane. 
And most chemicals that the cell needs to import or export out of the cell are actually impermeable. They can't pass through the membrane uh, freely. Um, and so there's this whole class of proteins that are called transporters that actually are in charge of controlling what goes in and out of, of the cell. And that works both to defend the cell as well as to take up n n appropriate nutrients at the appropriate time or to release appropriate chemicals at the appropriate time. So exactly how transporters work is still really a bit of a mystery. But in the recent years, there, in the recent years there's been a bit of an explosion of transporter proteins that have been structurally characterized, usually by crystal structures. And one of the interesting observations that people have made about these proteins is that they tend to have this what's called inverted repeat symmetry, so that even though the transporter is one chain, within that chain there's sort of this um, two halves that seem to be inverted with respect to each other. And so this gave a um, pretty simple an interesting hypothesis as to how transport might be taking place, which is that there's a binding site for the, protein, for the molecule in question that is wedged between these two inverted repeats. And so that transport could take place by simply this protein undergoing uh, changes between two stable states, one in which the protein exposes the binding site to the outside of the cell, and the other in which it exposes it to the inside of the cell. And so that's called the alternating access model. And it's particularly interesting to consider the implications of this model as far as how um, transport could have actually evolved. So consider some sort of a primordial ancient transmembrane protein where you just have a single chain that's inserted into the lipid bilayer. And imagine that sometime later down the evolutionary pathway, it learns to dimerize. So you have this inverted dimer. And so that even some further time down the evolution, uh, some binding site for a particular molecule originated at one end of the molecule. Now, remember that because this is a symmetric sequence, so you have the same chain going this way as, as well as this way, if there's a binding site over here, there will be one over here as well. And so at this point, um, if al the alternating access model were true, it seems that all you really need for transport to take place is to go from a protein which is stable in the symmetric state to one that has this bistability, where it's, instead of being stable here, it's stable in one of these two states. And so that by flipping between these two states, it can make transport happen. So that seems to be a pretty simple, but at the same time, pretty plausible model uh, for both the mechanism of transport and how it may have evolved. And so what we thought is, well, if this is true, then you should be able to use this simple concept to design a new transporter, completely de novo. So we had this crazy idea that we needed to use this alternating access model to design a novel transporter. So to be in line with this alternating access hypothesis, we decided to, des decided to design it in the context of an anti-parallel tetrameric helix bundle. So you have four helices going up, down, up, down. Further, we decided to design a zinc transporter because we knew what it takes to bind a soft metal like zinc. And so we were able to engineer a zinc binding site. Well, really, we didn't engineer it. We just kind of looked up in nature how zinc atoms tend to be bound and created this sort of idealistic zinc binding site. And we next, search, uh, we next um, used our ability to tell what's designable and what's not to search for a highly designable tetrameric bundle that could house this kind of a zinc binding site inside of it. And that gave us our starting template. So at this point, uh, we had to consider this issue of bistability. So for that, we, designed, we defined two states, or, or two possible structural conformations. One in which the molecule is symmetric, so zinc can bind at the top and in the bottom at the same time. And so in that conformation, the transporter won't work. It'll just bind zinc and, and sit there. And another conformation where binding zinc at one end opens the molecule at the other end and precludes binding, uh, and precludes binding at the other end. So at this point, the design challenge was no less but to make a sequence that could insert into the lipid bilayer, form a tetramer, bind zinc, and have some preference for the asymmetric state. So because we were beginning to be interested in these subtle rearrangements and these dynamic properties of the protein, we had to use, we had to create a completely new design strategy which used, um, which used dynamics information in selecting sequences. So um, just to kind of give you the gist of it without going into too much detail, we broke the, the procedure into two parts. In one part, we essentially um, assessed the overall stability 
of this uh, structure. That is, is the sequence going to insert into the membrane, and is it going to form a tetramer that looks something like this? And so that was more of a coarse grain calculation. And then the finer grain for sequences that did pass this test, we then subjected them to more accurate free energy calculations to select those that would, be, uh, that would prefer the asymmetric state. And it actually turned out that, oh, sorry, and so this stage in the calculation then encoded stability, whereas this free energy calculation encoded functionality. <clears throat> and it actually turned out to be pretty important that we used these um, higher accuracy models, because if we, if we had used um, just the conventional potential energy-based models that are typically used in design, we actually couldn't find any sequences that would prefer the asymmetric conformation. And that's simply because if you optimize the packing of side chains um, at one end of the molecule, there's really no reason why you shouldn't repeat the exact same thing. Because again, the sequence is completely symmetric. There's no reason why you shouldn't repeat the exact same thing to get the optimal potential energy. But if you use a free energy-based metric, you'll recognize that if you, for example, and this is one way of doing it, if you, so, so, so to speak, overpack the middle of this molecule, then you'll make it so that it prefers to open up because the, um, the state where both ends are together is too poor in microstates. So it's not sort of an enthalpic effect. It's more of an entropic effect. Um, so this isn't actually the sequence that we chose. There were some additional um, criteria that we subjected our designs to. For example, we had to see a way that zinc molecules could conceivably go from here to here. And for instance, in this particular sequence, that's impossible because the, the core is too crowded. Uh, but eventually, we picked, picked three um, plausible solutions. And the first one of those, the top one of those, is undergoing experimental characterization uh, right now, actually. And so far, actually, the results are pretty uh, promising. So first of all, we showed that it does form a tetramer in a lipid-like environment, and it does bind zinc. And moreover, excitingly, it seems to also function as a zinc transporter. And so this is preliminary, but I'll, to but I'll tell you how we tested this. So we formed lipid vesicles in the presence of our protein so that it could insert, and also in the presence of zinc ions shown here in pink and, the zinc sensor, and a zinc sensor molecule, which is, which is this guy over here. And the zinc sensor molecule is basically a molecule that becomes fluorescent when it binds zinc so that we, if we excite it at a certain wavelength, we expect emission at a, at a certain different wavelength. Um, and so then we washed the outside of these vesicles off of the excess zinc, uh, uh, zinc sensor so that, so that the only fluorescence comes from within the vesicle. So at this point, because there's zinc outside and inside, and because they're at equal concentration, regardless of whether our transporter works, um, we don't expect a change in the level of fluorescence. Because even if it's pumping things out, it's also pumping things in, and so there's no net change. On the other hand, if we add a zinc chelating molecule to the outside of the vesicles, so that the, the, it binds to zinc and precludes it from being transported inward, the only transport that remi remains is outward transport, so that uh, zinc sensors will be gradually robbed of their zinc ions, and the level of fluorescence should gradually drop. And of course, we do the same thing as a control without peptide to make sure that when we add EDTA or a zinc chelator in that case, that the level of fluorescence does not drop. And so when we perform this experiment, we see exactly what we expect. So that without our peptide, the, le the, fluores the level of fluorescence really doesn't change at all, except for perhaps some bleaching effects. Whereas when our peptide is present, we have this nice and gradual reductions in the reduction of fluorescence, which indicates that it does seem to be pumping zinc ions out. Now, we still, of course, don't know how it's doing it. And we don't know if it's doing it in the way we designed it. But it is also encouraging that this function seems to be specific for zinc. So that if we try a harder ion, like a calcium, then this doesn't work uh, anymore. And this is really very consistent with the fact that we designed specifically a soft ion metal binding site in our protein. Uh, we're also pursuing crystallographic characterization of this protein. So yeah, I don't know if any of you um, do crystallography, but um, so it's, if you do, it's fun to look at crystals. So this is what they look like. They're, they're reasonably large in size. And they do have some interesting diffraction patterns, but we don't have enough data to solve the structure yet. So this is still ongoing. Uh, but again, I want to stress that this is preliminary. But so far, it seems that uh, we've, at least so far, uh, reached our design goal. We were able to 
make a molecule that's tetrameric in a lipid-like environment. It binds zinc. It even transports zinc and does so in a zinc in a metal-specific manner. And I want to stress the importance of using a dynamics, more of an accurate dynamics-based approach in this design. This isn't typically done in protein design. And I think as our design um, goals become more complicated, the use of such technology will have to become more and more common. OK, so how well are we doing? Actually, how well are we doing on time? You, you got some time. OK. But also, how well are we doing as far as understanding uh, the, the, the coding language of proteins? Well, I think we've done reasonably well, but there are also lots of future challenges. So, you know, I showed you that um, we can use, we can understand how specificity is encoded in protein interactions. We can use the natural principles by which proteins assemble to create some very unnatural assemblies, and we can even design some complicated functionality. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very likely that future challenges are going to require even better computational model, even better understanding of how structure defines function. So, for example, um, you know, I told you that part of this interactome is spanned by BZIPs, and we now understand how specificity is encoded in BZIP interactions. But there are lots of other interactions here, and they occur via different modes of interaction. And it would be great to have a general structure-based model that can predict which two proteins interact and which two don't. Because whereas it's possible to solve the structure of every protein, at least conceivably, it seems very, very unlikely to solve the structure of every complex that is possible within the cell. Um, the other part of it is that oftentimes the formation of any one of these interactions goes beyond the simple creation of a complex. Instead, there seems to be information transfer in the process of interaction. And this happens through a process known as allosteric. So allosteric is where a conformational or binding event at one end of a protein molecule propagates through the structure and is read off and understood, so to speak, at the other end of the molecule. And it's a very fundamental um, process by which a lot of information gets transferred within the cell. And I think that to understand things like this, we need to have much better, uh, much more accurate uh, physics-based models on, on the structural level. OK, so I'd just like to thank all of these people, who, all of whom were instrumental in, uh, in, in a lot of this work. Um, and, and basically, I would like to especially thank my uh, doctoral and postdoctoral advisors, Amy Keating and Bill DeGrado. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank NIH for paying my salary. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'd very much like to thank you for this cool mug that you gave me. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, so, so I think the transporter would have a lot of cool applications. I think we're not there yet as far as our transporter because we still have to understand what it is that we designed. Like, does it actually work the way we want it to work? Because, I mean, there's alternative ways in which these experiments could have worked out. I mean, you know, we're, in, we're making a protein that inserts into the bilayer, maybe it's tetrameric, maybe it binds zinc, but maybe the exact process by which it transports zinc isn't you know, quite the way we designed, uh, which would be very important to know. So right now we're focusing on kind of treating it as a system and learning about how it works. And I think it'll teach us a lot about how transport works as well, because it's a transporter, but it's a very simple one, so we can learn some lessons. But I think if it actually does turn out that it was successful and it works the way we wanted it, yeah, it'd be hugely interesting to explore remediation applications or maybe you know this algae application that you mentioned but we're not we're not quite there yet <laughs> yeah that's right but 
Uh, so what are the, how do we decide what kind of chemical group to recognize it with? So that was purely our chemical intuition. And, and uh, it wasn't any kind of, um, I guess it wasn't, it was rational design. That's what they call it, rational design. So, and, and this was the thinking that we knew what groups interacted strongly with nanotubes. It's aromatic groups. But we really wanted to stay away from them because um, that, that produces a very strong interaction. And we were afraid that then it would be the interaction of a single, single unit with the tube that would drive really the interaction rather than the formation of any specific assembly. So we almost wanted to take a functional group that would be most unlikely to produce a very strong affinity with the nanotube so that if we in fact form uh, an assembly, it would be very likely because that particular structure formed rather than it just likes to stick, stick to tubes. Because it's actually really simple to make peptides that stick to tubes. And DNA sticks to tubes fantastically. Um, so. Uh -huh. I'm wondering if this desirability approach could be used in engineering the biomolecules so there won't be as much of a nanoparticle nanoparticle interaction. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose. So in this case, we didn't see any aggregation of uh, nanotubes. We, you know, we did this, um, was it two years ago or something? Uh, and so it, it took a while to publish, et cetera. So, you know, since then, these samples. Um, maybe some of them were thrown away. But, but certainly for at least a year, nothing really happened. There was no aggregation. And I think part of the reason for that is that um, a, a very large portion of the surface, I think, though we can't say that specifically exactly, but based on the TEM images and based on some back-in-the-envelope calculations, it seems that the coverage is actually almost you know, complete. So that the nanotube doesn't see a lot of water or doesn't see a lot of other nanotubes very often. So that kind of prevents aggregation. Now, maybe if you wait longer, they'll aggregate, you know, because it's a kinetic thing. Um, but this could be one way is to, to make sure that you don't leave a lot of naked nanotube or naked nanoparticle surface uh, to prevent aggregation. Yes, yes. So you, you, so there are a lot of proteins that um, have homologs all the way down to bacteria, and they will have similar structures. Um, there are also a lot of proteins that are specific to the to eukarya. There are a lot of proteins that are specific to mammals, and they they don't occur. But what's interesting is there's really <clears throat> when you start looking at the local uh, structural motif level, there's nothing new. And there isn't anything new once you start, once you saw a thousand proteins. You've pretty much seen what there is to see on the local level. And that's kind of what I think makes this method work is that, you know, you know you're working with a limited space of local possibilities. So you might as well pick from that and that increases your chance of success. As far as overall folds, it does get a lot more complex with the complexity of the organism. So, you know, maybe we have machinery uh, that when you look at it in, in terms of its full structure, is a lot more complex than any machinery that bacteria have. But on a local level, on the, local, on the level of sort of, you know, what are the atoms that make the local interactions work, it's all the same. So about the sink transporter, mm -hmm. did you test the sink transporter with its concentration difference, or was it each concentration in the outside? Well, so yes, right? So because... At first, the concentration is the same, but then we add the chelator, and and it reduces the concentration. We actually add excess chelator, so it reduces the concentration to basically zero on the outside, effective concentration. So yeah, there there is a concentration gradient. So this isn't. There's different kinds of transport in natural systems. There's energy dependent, and then there's just down the gradient. This is, kind is just down the gradient. Thank you, Gilbert. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much.